Okay, so get ready because today we're diving into something that might totally change how you think about viruses, like completely flip the script. Oh, I'm intrigued. It's all about this idea of super spreaders. Have you heard about this? Yeah, it's been fascinating diving into this with Gladwell's new book, Revenge of the Tipping Point. Exactly. That deep dive. And it's not just about like who gets a virus, but who really spreads it around. It's like we tend to think of viruses as spreading kind of evenly. Yeah. Right? But Gladwell's saying, nope, there are these select few. These super spreaders. And they're the ones driving these big outbreaks. It's like the 80-20 rule, but for viruses. Exactly. And he connects it back to his book, The Tipping Point. Remember the law of the few? Oh, yeah. That small group of people can have a massive impact. Okay, so walk me through how Gladwell's bringing this to life. Well, he starts with this really interesting example. Picture this, January 2020, right at the beginning of COVID, and a student is traveling from Wuhan to Boston. Okay, so peak COVID anxiety time. Right, and it's not like a quick trip. We're talking a 30-hour journey. He even tests positive for COVID when he gets to Boston. 30 hours. You'd think everyone on that plane would be doomed. I mean, that seems like a recipe for disaster. You'd think so, right. But here's the thing. He didn't seem to infect anyone. Wait, wh how? how is that even possible? 30 hours, positive COVID test, and no one else gets sick. I know, it's a head scratcher. And it really highlights how our assumptions about transmission can be so off. This is where understanding super spreaders comes in. Okay, so how do we even begin to unravel this? If it's not just about being in close proximity, what's going on? Well, scientists have gotten really good at tracking how viruses spread. Mm. They can actually look at the genetic makeup of the virus, like its DNA. Oh, like those ancestry tests, but for viruses? Exactly. And just like our DNA has tiny variations that make us unique, viruses have them too. So they can trace these variations like fingerprints to see who infected whom. So it's like creating a family tree for a virus. That's incredible. It is. And what they're finding is that most cases of COVID, for example, resulted in very limited transmission. Someone might infect a family member or a close contact, but then it fizzles out. Okay, so it's not like this unstoppable chain reaction we often imagine. Not usually. And that's a really important point because Gladwell contrasts these cases with what he calls super spreader events. Okay, hit me with an example. What makes an event a super spreader event? Well, one that Gladwell talks about that you might remember from the news is the Biogen conference in February 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was a big biotech conference, right? In Boston, I think. Exactly. People came from all over the world. And unfortunately, it became this textbook example of a super spreader event. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. What happened? It was like a mass outbreak, wasn't it? It was. Over 50 attendees tested positive for COVID. And when they did that genetic tracing we were talking about, they found the same strain popping up. Wait, so they could trace those infections back to the conference? Yep. And it wasn't just contained to Boston. They found this same strain in 29 U.S. states and even internationally. Wow. One conference became this massive dispersal point. It's mind-blowing. How could one event be so impactful? That's the million-dollar question. Yeah. And it all points back to the presence of super spreaders at that event. Researchers estimate that a single super spreader there could have been responsible for a huge chunk of those infections. Wait, so one person... Just one person could have set off that chain reaction. It's likely, and it just goes to show how crucial it is to understand this whole super spreader phenomenon. It totally changes how you think about containing a virus, right? Because yeah. if one person can have that much impact. Exactly. And Gladwell argues that this understanding challenges our traditional approaches to outbreak control. Instead of treating everyone as equally contagious, what if we could identify and focus on those who are most likely to drive transmission? It's a fascinating idea, but I can already see how that could get really tricky really fast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It brings up a whole host of ethical considerations. No easy answers there. But before we get into those ethical dilemmas, let's unpack this whole super spreader thing a bit more. Like, what makes someone a super spreader in the first place? So how do we even begin to understand what makes someone a super spreader? Is it just random chance or is there more to it? Well, it's definitely more nuanced than just luck of the draw. And you know how we've always been told to cover our coughs and sneezes? Oh, absolutely. Like drilled into my brain since I was a kid. Right. Well, Gladwell points out that we've probably been focusing on the wrong thing. Wait, really? You mean it's not all about those big visible droplets? It's not just about those. Turns out those tiny invisible particles we exhale, those aerosols, they play a huge role. Aerosols. 
So even when we're talking about COVID, it's not just about like sneezing directly on someone. It's these tiny particles we're constantly breathing out. Exactly. It's not about if you exhale them. We all do. It's about how M-U-C-H. How much? Like, are some people just spewing out way more aerosols than others? That's what the research suggests. Gladwell talks about this one study where scientists measured aerosols from 194 people. And get this, only 18 of them were classified as super emitters. Okay, so out of almost 200 people, only a handful were these super emitters. So what makes them so super? Well, these 18 individuals, they were producing 20 times more aerosols than the lowest emitters. 20 times? That's insane. It's like some of us are just aerosol machines compared to others. It's a pretty wild thought, right? <laughs> and it really changes how we think about exposure. You could be sitting next to someone on the bus, both masked up, and think you're relatively safe. But if they're a super emitter, it might not even matter. It really throws a wrench into things. Mm -hmm. Gladwell actually makes this really interesting comparison to car emissions. Car emissions. Okay, now I'm really curious. How do car emissions relate to super spreaders? He's saying... Just like you have a small percentage of cars on the road producing a crazy amount of pollution, you have a small percentage of people producing a crazy amount of virus-laden aerosols. So instead of focusing on every car, or in this case, every person, you could maybe target those high-emission folks. Right, for a much bigger impact. But that brings us to the big question, doesn't it? The ethical implications. Because how do you even begin to target something like that? But before we get into that, I'm still stuck on what makes someone a super emitter in the first place. Is it just something we're born with? Well, there's still a lot we don't know, but Gladwell highlights some interesting findings, particularly this possible link between dehydration and super spreading. Dehydration? Really? That's not something I've ever heard before in the context of viruses. Yeah, it might seem strange at first, but think about it. When you're properly hydrated, your respiratory system, everything's nice and moist, right? Those membranes are more effective at trapping those pesky viral particles. But when you're dehydrated... Things get a little uh, sticky. Exactly. That mucus gets thicker, and it's not as good at doing its job. So the virus can basically hitch a ride on those thicker particles and escape more easily. It's a bit like that. Yeah. And there's actually research that found people who are dehydrated, they tend to have thicker, more viscous saliva. And you know what that means. More fuel for those aerosols. Exactly. It's like creating the perfect environment for those aerosols to form when you talk or even just breathe. Wow. Okay. So next time someone tells me to drink more water, I'll be sure to tell them it's for the greater good to prevent me from becoming a super spreader. Right. It's not just about individual health anymore. Mm -hmm. It really highlights that connection between our own actions and public health. And it makes you wonder, are there certain people who are more susceptible to becoming dehydrated? Well, Gladwell points out that older adults folks with higher BMIs and people already battling infections, they tend to be more prone to dehydration. So if you're already more vulnerable to getting sick, dehydration could make you more likely to spread it too. That's a scary thought. It definitely adds another layer of complexity. And here's the thing, this whole super spreader phenomenon, it's not just limited to COVID-19. Oh, really? So we've seen this with other viruses too. Oh, yeah. Gladwell takes us all the way back to the 1970s with this fascinating measles outbreak at a school. At first, everyone thought it was spreading on the school bus. You know, kids packed in, close quarters. It seems like a logical assumption. You'd think so, right? But they traced the outbreak back to a single second grader who didn't even ride the bus. Wait, what? So how did this one kid manage to spread measles like wildfire if they weren't even on the bus? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. She ended up infecting students from 14 different classrooms. It was a classic super spreader event, even before we really had a term for it. 14 classrooms, just from one kid. That just blows my mind. It really shows how this whole super spreader thing isn't just some recent phenomenon. It's been happening all along. Exactly. And it really makes you wonder how many outbreaks throughout history might have been driven by these super spreaders that didn't even know to look for. It really challenges our whole understanding of how viruses spread, doesn't it? And it makes you realize that even with something as contagious as measles. It's not just about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's about who else is in that room with you. So we've been talking about super spreaders, these select individuals who can really amplify an outbreak. But if we've known about this for decades, why haven't we heard more about it? Why wasn't it like a bigger deal during the pandemic? That's a great question. And I think it gets to the heart of the issue. 
Knowing about super spreaders and knowing what to do with that knowledge are two very different things. Because it's not like you can just slap a label on someone and say, sorry, you're a super spreader, no public spaces for you. Exactly. It brings up all sorts of ethical dilemmas. Gladwell really dives into this, and he actually uses a really interesting analogy. Okay, yeah, I'm intrigued. What's the analogy? He compares it to those high emission vehicles we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Remember how he said it's way more efficient to target those specific cars than to make every single car undergo emissions testing? Yeah, I remember that, but I feel like you're about to drop a butt on me. Well, the thing is, those older, higher-emitting cars, they're often owned by people who might not be able to afford newer, cleaner vehicles. So you're trying to solve one problem pollution in this case, but you might end up disproportionately impacting people who are already struggling. Exactly. And it's not hard to see how that same logic could apply to super spreaders. What if certain groups of people are more likely to be super emitters, maybe due to age, health conditions, or even their job? It could lead to some really unfair discriminatory policies. Exactly. And that's the tightrope we have to walk. Yeah. How do you use this knowledge responsibly? Mm -hmm. How do you protect public health without infringing on individual rights and freedoms? It's a tough one, that's for sure. It makes you realize there are no easy answers when it comes to this stuff. There really aren't. But I think that's what makes Gladwell's book so important. He's not shying away from these uncomfortable questions. If anything, he's pushing us to confront them head on. Because we can't just ignore this stuff, right? We have to figure out a way to navigate these complexities. Exactly. Knowledge is power but we have to use it wisely. And that means having these conversations, grappling with the ethical implications, and figuring out what kind of future we want to build. Well said. It's been a really thought-provoking deep dive, to say the least. We've covered a lot of ground, from those early COVID cases to the science of aerosols and now these ethical dilemmas. It's a lot to process. It really is. It makes you rethink everything you thought you knew about viruses and how they spread. It really does. And it highlights just how interconnected everything is. It's not just about our individual health. It's about the choices we make and how they impact those around us, sometimes in ways we can't even imagine. Absolutely. It's a whole new way of looking at things. It is. And on that note, we'll leave our listeners with one final thought to ponder. Imagine a world where we DO have that quick, non-invasive test to identify potential super spreaders. What would you want to see done with that information? Would it change your own behavior? It's a question with no easy answers, but one that I think we all need to sit with as we move forward. 